And welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Beautiful Monday morning. On this day in history, I'm going back to the year 2012 to uh -huh. tell you about the day that a uh, 31-year-old state of emergency was finally lifted in Egypt. It is the longest I've heard of. I don't know if there's any hmm. state of emergency that has been that long. Do you think we need something like that here? Yeah, we do. Absolutely. Um, yes, we do. Hmm. You know, but, you know, the, the, you know, the fear really is, you know, it's not just, you know, declaring a state of emergency. It's actually being Following able to enact, through. you know, and follow, yes. you know, through a state of emergency. Because I remember, you know, during the NSAS protest, the government said everyone should sit at, sit at home, you know, and, you know, uh, there was a curfew. Mm -hmm. But they didn't provide security for the state while there was a curfew. And so that's why there was all that chaos and people took advantage of the lack of security. Yes. And, you know, destroyed the whole, you know, most of Lagos state. So um, we can, you know, do that. But can we actually... Um, pull through with it. That's that's the question. But let's go to Egypt. On this day in 2012, um, the, the emergency was um, emergency law was finally lifted. Um, it was first enacted in Egypt in 1958 as Law Number 162 of 1958. A state of emergency was declared um, in um, 1967 during the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, which lasted until 1980. After a break of 18 months, the state of emergency was reimposed following the assassination of President Anwar Sadat in 1981 and was repeatedly extended every three years. The continuous state of emergency was one of the grievances of demonstrators that gave rise to the Egyptian Revolution of 2011, if you remember, uh, what you know, was called, popularly called the Arab Spring. After, after um, Hosni, um, Hosni Mubarak resigned, the emergency law expired on the 31st of May in 2012, and with it, the state of emergency um, uh, two weeks also before the second round of voting if, in Egypt's 2012 presidential election. Um, the military governments imposed a de facto martial law also in 2012, extending the arrest powers of security forces and all of that. But, you know, it basically was a three-year state of emergency that continued to be extended and extended and extended until this day in 2012 when, of course, Hosni Mubarak uh, resigned and, you know, that became uh, suspended. Um, you know, for me, you know, I don't think I've heard of any state of emergency that has, you know, lasted that long. Um, in May 2008, uh, there was an extension to June 2010. Um, and, of course, you know, like I said, it was one of the key demands uh, during the Arab Spring in 2011, you know, which was eventually approved in 2012. Hmm. You know, like you mentioned, uh, since 1981. Yep. Wow. Uh, you know, the assassination, assassination of President Anwar Sadat. You know, this state of emergency really gave the police unprecedented power to make arrests, detain suspects, you know, try them in, in special courts. You know, this caused so many demonstrations People were very opposed to this. They didn't like what the, you know, what the police were doing to the people because of just how much power they wielded because of that state of emergency. So it was really a jubilation in the country in 2012. Yeah. You know, all the major news, news outlets covered it. People were celebrating in the streets, enjoying the fact that at the end of the day, after over about three decades and more, this state of emergency you know, had come to an end. So yeah. yes. You know, and um, um, the, the, the Arab Spring, well, let me, let me all just, you know, add to some of the things that you said, mm -hmm. you know, the effects of the state of emergency. Yeah. You know, for 31 years, um, it basically meant that security forces were allowed to arrest, you know, without, you know, a warrant, without any, you know, necessary cause, mm -hmm. um, random people, any person that they felt was a threat or felt like was going to be a threat, you know, was arrested. And so they took advantage of all of that. And, you know, when, when the Arabs started, you know, in 2011 and, you know, when Egypt and Hosni Mubarak eventually was, you know, moved out of government, um, it was a sigh of relief for the e Egyptian people. But I'm going to relate that with Nigeria and show you that we're not in a state of emergency yet, but Nigerian security forces have, and if you follow the events in the southeast in the last couple of days, have, you know, carried out what is pretty similar to what was happening in Egypt, mm. and that is arresting people um, for no actual reasons, without any actual warrants for their arrest, without, you know, solid reasons why they are being arrested, and just picking up people randomly and all of that. So... But that's like a, a norm. Not, that is, that is well. 1961, South Africa, the Union of South Africa became a republic in the state history, May the 31st, 1961. Um, 
We know that how, you know about how South Africa was under the rule of the British Empire, you know, but the National Ruling Party of South Africa was greatly opposed to the monarchy, and you know, referring to uh, Queen Elizabeth as you know the the, the crown, you know. So they basically signed in, uh, voted in a referendum um, the previous year in the year 1960. Majority whites, you know, took pay, took uh, part in that referendum. Um, we know that 52.29% uh, of the voters were, you know, um, approved a referendum saying that um, they wanted South Africa to become a republic. So this referendum led to the end of, you know, the monarchy, the British hold and rule in South Africa. And uh, Charles Swart was elected by Parliament as the first state president of the South African Republic. You know, um, the references to the crown replaced by, um, you know, the state's oath of allegiance was no longer to the queen, but to the state, the Republic of South Africa. You know, South Africa has a very rich and long history, starting from that, um, um, what, what would you call it, that boat wreck on Table Mountain, when, you know, traders discover that, um, you know, many, many centuries ago, discover that, oh, South Africa's weather, their climate, everything was similar to Europe. So they said, okay, let's stay here. Shipped away all the rebels, you know, people who were supposed to be killed, you know, in, in foreign oh countries. That, I mean, that's, that's what history that's tells us. Anyway. You know, that, that pretty much, that's, that, that pretty much, pretty much is what it was. You know, the Bush, the Bunsu, nice. the Bunsu, mm. the Bantu, all of them, you know, people, ethnic groups in South Africa, they were all repressed. People became slaves in their own country. People who were sent <laughs> to die in their own country became heads. You know, the oh. history, that's why I said the history of South Africa is very rich, long, diverse. But this day in history, South Africa became a republic. Yeah, you know, and of course, you know, this is one year after. Oh, actually, you know, we became a republic in 63. So it was yeah. you know, a couple of years before us, you know. But look at the, you know, growth, you know, between these two countries, you know, mm. South Africa and Nigeria, you know. And you can always say that we could have done better uh, with ourselves and where we, where we are uh, today as a country. You know, there's a time it felt like we we're growing. And then, you know, oof. All right, stay with us. Uh, we're taking a short break. When we come back, we're moving into our first conversation for today. In Yobong Umoren, the name became popular a couple of weeks ago and is still making headlines. But now an investigative journalist is calling out some inadequacies in the police report. And we'll be talking about that after this short break. We'll be back.